the gospel text for this Resurrection Sunday is taken from John chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. On the first day of the week, we would call that Sunday, but but in Hebrew, the, the days are named by numbers, except for the Sabbath. So the first day, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. She saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she went running to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said to them, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they've put him. At that, Peter and the other disciple went out heading for the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and got to the tomb first. Stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then following him, Simon Peter also came. He entered the tomb and saw the linen cloths lying there. The wrapping that had been on his head was not lying with the linen cloths, but was folded up in a separate place by itself. The other disciple who had reached the tomb first, then also went in, saw, and believed. For they did not yet understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to the place where they were staying. But Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she was crying, she stooped to look into the tomb. She saw two angels in white sitting where Jesus' body had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you crying? Because they've taken away my Lord, she told them, and I don't know where they've put him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know it was Jesus. Woman, Jesus said to her, why are you crying? Who is it that you're seeking? Supposing he was the gardener, the landscaper, she replied, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. Turning around, she said to him in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Don't cling to me, Jesus told her, since I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and tell them that I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and she told them what he had said to her. This, the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated as we go into uh, the scriptures today. I've entitled today's message, uh, Two Realities. And that, that's what we will be focusing on today as we get into the scriptures today. Let's pray and we'll go into it. Thank you, Father, for bringing us together and for drawing us around your word. We do pray that you open up our spirit to be able to perceive and to realize and understand the glory of your salvation, the glory of your works, and of your presence. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm always amazed, and for years have been amazed, at this story, at this account. I hesitate calling it a story, because that then, in our culture, tends to put it into the realm of Disneyland. This is not a story, it's an account. But I'm amazed at this because here you have a woman that for three, three and a half years thereabouts was intimately involved in Jesus' ministry. She intimately knew him, shared meals with him, ministry with him, saw miracles with him, 
And within three days after his death, couldn't recognize him. In other Gospels, we see that he still had some of the marks because, or some indication of who he was because he had, he had the marks in his hands. In fact, it says to Thomas, don't, don't doubt, believe. There, put your hand in my side. Check it out. It's me. Touch. Here, not. So, wasn't time in this case. But something radically, radically happened between his crucifixion and his resurrection that the very person that a number of people had known intimately for over three years was now simultaneously the same and completely different. Not only that, <laughs> but she gets to the tomb and there's two angels sitting there. Now, if you've ever gone into a, 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 um, a grave around Jerusalem, they would put different... Um, it usually have a number of people there and one would sit, the, the head would be at a certain position and um, the feet at another. And she sees two angels dressed in white and doesn't even recognize who they are. You know, where, where'd you put them? And it is so startling that unless the Lord reveals what's taking place, it just kind of remains a mystery. But that mystery is revealed, and I'd like to go delve into that day. Paul, I think, says it very succinctly when he writes to the Ephesian church. This is chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. Paul, speaking of Jesus, he made known to us, and God, he made known to us the mystery of his will. God has, according to his good pleasure, he wants us to know his will. It gives him pleasure to know his will. According to his good pleasure that he purposed in Christ as a plan <clears throat> for the right time to bring everything together in Christ, both things in heaven and things on earth in him. We live in this realm. It's physical in nature. We hear the creaks. You know, I've been here for 20 some years. You, you think one of these days I would fix that thing. We, 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 we see things and we hear things. We touch things and we taste things. I'm going to call my parents later on and they're going to tell me what they are serving. I already know because my brother has made the pulled pork. That's this world. And outside of the spirit of Christ, this is all we know. But Jesus came to reveal the eternal realm that's all around us. That if we could see it, this world would be boring. And the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory. And Jesus from day one was involved in the proclamation of the kingdom and as such bringing those two things together in revelation. So for three years he was teaching and taking what we do know, we, he would teach in parables. So this is what we know. We know about farming. So the kingdom of God is like someone who went to sow seed and begins to reveal this hidden realm now reveal through Christ. In fact, Jesus himself, or even before Jesus, John the Baptist says, he, meaning Jesus, 
testifies to what he has seen and is seen and hears. In the spirit realm, Jesus sees the whole plan. We don't see it, but through him, he reveals this other realm that sooner or later we will enter. But in the meantime, as we wait for his return, this is what he has been moving toward the revelation of things unseen that are so glorious, so majestic, so eternally beautiful and wonderful in its nature that this world pales. People begin to understand as Jesus says, I don't belong here. I belong to a dip. My home is in heaven with Jesus until he brings that finally to earth and reestablishes what God originally created in Genesis. You see, in Genesis, we have an account that is so foreign to us that it's easily put in our minds in any way into the category of Snow White. God creates the world breathes life into us, and we are an eternal, spiritual, physical being, one of God's family, made in God's image, able to speak into this world the words of God and have things move accordingly, to have say over and let them have say over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air over the livestock, over the wild animals, over everything that crawls on the ground. Let them have say. And God intimately is one with us in this garden. God makes the garden so that we could hang out. And that's where he dwells with us. It's so foreign because we're so separated from it that it's hard to imagine In this realm, there's no death, none disease. You don't need a hospital. You don't need doctors. You don't need medical schools. You don't need hospice. It's not a reality. It could be a reality, so God warns us, but it's not yet. You don't grow old. You don't lose your hair. You don't gain 40 pounds. Different reality altogether. You're one with one another. You don't need to even lock your door. Remember those days? They're gone. And now we have adjusted to the new reality. See how easy it is to forget how it once was, we'll go back further to that time in which we were with God. There's no death. There's no disease. There may be allergies, but we're immune to them. There's no jealousy. There's no competition. There's this unity. There's this one in spirit in which we are completely content and fulfilled. No striving, no tears, no pain, no suffering, nothing. This is not how it's supposed to be. But like the frog in the kettle, we can get used to it, forget the way it was supposed to be, and just because we're very good at adapting, we just adapt to the new environment. We just shut ourselves off from any kind of pain, try to ignore it, and don't, if you can't ignore it, do a little bit of things, but, but just forget that it's not meant to be this way. And in Genesis, we read that there is this separation now between this realm in which God dwells because God is spirit and this physical realm. And this physical realm, historically, as you read through the scripture, is not a good place to live. It is filled from the fourth chapter of Genesis 
where Cain kills his brother with violence and read any history book. And that's basically the entire history of the human race. How efficiently, how quickly, and how advanced we can become at killing, raping, torturing, threatening, and manipulating one another. And we've come to believe that that's just the norm. So Jesus' ministry is indeed foreign. But throughout this, God has promised, uh uh-uh. The rebellion that started in the heavenly realm, the one that brought death in here through deception, doesn't get the victory. Delayed it, but can't overcome it. And throughout history, it's been an act of God coming back into this world to redeem it, to bring it back to him, to recreate it. And then through the prophets, you begin to get glimpses of it. Starting with Job, where he says, even when I'm dead, in my flesh, I will still see God. And all through the prophets, you get glimpses of it. Isaiah, on my holy mountain, there will be no more killing. The lion will lie down with the lamb. And the little child can put his hand into the hole of the poisonous viper and not get harmed. There is not one instance of someone being harmed on my mountain that I will recreate. And so this idea of a resurrection that God brings through the prophets, brings through Israel, begins to develop. And as such, God speaks to the prophet by revealing a heavenly plan through earthly people and giving them a vision And so as the book of Hebrews says, in the past, God has spoken through the prophets. When we were having our our Seder meal, I got a chance to sit down or have a little bit of a conversation with Robert, who was leading from Jews for Jesus, and was asked, why do you think that there's this resistance to the Messiah in Judaism? Now, he grew up in Judaism. As a Jewish boy, went to Jewish school, he goes, because we don't know the scriptures. We focus on the first five books, but we never were taught the prophets. It says it's very similar to a degree to Catholicism where you know the rituals, but you don't know the word. See, the word is revelation. It's not just a story per se. It is literally spiritual revelation. It's going to be foreign to your ears. That's why it's so tempting to go on a trip rather than read the word because A trip, a vacation, is much more exciting than the revelation of the Word of God, unless God reveals it to you. Then it's like, I can't leave. So, in this case that we're reading today, what you're seeing is a resurrected Jesus, not just coming back to life, within the same confines of his physical nature before the resurrection, but coming back now in what we call a glorified body. It's a sample. It's a foretaste. It's a vision. It's not just a vision, but a real live physical example of what we are all going to experience when he returns and recreates the entire world. We will have a body like his. It will be glorified in nature. It will not die. It will not be suspect to disease. It will not be suspect or under the influence of decay or corruption. It will be like his. And because it was physical in nature, you could see it. Mary could see it. But because it was otherworldly, he had now in himself brought the future reality of the resurrection and brought heaven, the spiritual realm, 
into his body, unified it. She couldn't perceive what it was. That's why she couldn't perceive it. Because it was not just physical, it was physical and spiritual united in one person the way it was meant to be. This is why. And there's two, there's two realities that are at work here. There's the kingdom reality, which allows us to perceive, to perceive the spiritual realm, which is a promise of God. Because as Jesus says, the resurrection in and of itself is profound, but it's certainly not the end. He ministers in this glorified body, but hidden from public ministry, he no longer makes it public for everyone to see because you have to be prepared for this. You can't come into any kind of group that's not prepared spiritually and give them something spiritual. They will reject you. I had an experience. Oh, gosh, I'm a hard learner. So God's had to be patient with me because I just, but in my first call, I was uh, in, in charge of youth. Um, and, and, you know, the youth program, we didn't really have one. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's fading. And so a couple came. Hippolito is his name. Polo. And they wanted to, they were a young couple. They wanted to do youth. We like to work with the youth. Oh, my gosh. This is exciting. You know how desperate I was? Have you ever been desperate for someone to fill a position? No? Oh, we've got it. Our, our ministry isn't good if we don't have this. We're desperate. And so the first person that comes in through the door that says that they want to do it, yeah, sign them up. You know about that person. It doesn't matter. We need, we're desperate. I was desperate. And so Polo came to me with an idea. Because people will come to you with an idea. I've got an idea for the church. All right, let's hear it. We're a democracy, so we go with people's good ideas, right? Okay. I like to do, they have a Halloween party. We're not going to do that, but we'll have some kind of gathering for kids that don't want to do Halloween for the youth. We'll have a party here, and they can invite their friends, and it'll be a safe place. And, da, 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 and I said, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. You like, I mean, hey, do you think that's a good idea? You think that's a good idea? Yeah. And because we all thought it was a good idea, we did it. And it was a disaster. <laughs> Never did it again. And afterwards, I was praying about it. I don't understand. God said, you didn't ask if it was my idea. How many times have you done ministry? It's a good idea. Does anyone, anyone come back and say, you know, I've been praying about this and I don't get the green light on it yet. No, we don't do that. It's 51%. If 51% votes on it, we do it. And I, it came to bite me in the hee hee. Man, again, I'm a slow learner, so I had to learn that lesson over and over and over and over and over again. But the, the point of this account my testimony is that if I'm not reaching and seeking the kingdom, which is what God inquire, or in, in gives us the instruction to do, I can go off on very good ideas, not even realizing it's not God's idea. Or maybe it is God's idea, but not God's timing. Bringing the spiritual realm into the physical. We must seek God at all times. Otherwise, we run the risk of directing our lives according to the physical and only the physical. And I know what that's like because I've done that. I was thinking about this the other day. $120. That's how much a trombone player got for playing at Christmas in 1988. And I'm not, you know, inflation is probably more. So you're just waiting as a music person. Oh, I can't wait to get that call from that big cathedral because it's all about the pageants. You're not praying where God wants you to go worship. You're going to where you're going to get the money. It's all physical because you've got to have the pageantry and the, all this pageantry. It's not spiritual. It can be very beautiful, but it is not God's will unless he tells you. 
I didn't know. I liked 120 bucks. <laughs> I just thought that was God's will. You see. So when we read this account, this is profound. This is God saying all through this book, this book that can seem so boring in this world and in the flesh, this book that gives life, that is revelation. All through this book, when I give little glimpses of what I'm going to do to fix this, to bring about a resurrected reality, the end of this age, this age is coming to a close. I don't know if we have another Easter, and that's not a negative thing, that's a great thing. Wouldn't it be great for Jesus to return? I was wondering if I was gonna get an amen. Well, I don't know. It's really gonna conflict with my plans. Yeah, let me pray about that. That's one thing that's not going to alter God's plans is my prayer in that regard. But oh, what he's going to do. Or we could just kind of get callous, numb, just numb, eh, just more tense, more homeless, more problems. Well, we go off and do the pageantry, you see. And that's not God's plan. To seek God with all of our being. Not easy, but he empowers us through his spirit. And in the resurrection, I'm, I'm just amazed. Two, two angels show up. Maybe she didn't recognize them as angels. And Jesus himself, thinking he was a gardener. Because at that point in time, not yet, all she could see was the physical, and then he spoke her name. And that's what he did. It's so, it's so profound, because it's so intimate. When Jesus speaks your name, when Jesus speaks your name, that's all I want to hear is his voice. Other people speak my name, I got to take out the garbage. I got to pay for somebody to do something, whatever. Dad, son, whatever. When Jesus speaks your name, you melt. You melt. You melt. You can't, you can't stay. Just, you, 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 you melt. When the Spirit comes upon you, and he reveals himself. The things of this earth grow strangely dim. And that's all you want. That's all you want. For the longest time, I was desperate my first year in seminary because I was coming off the mountain of, of, of having that experience with him. And in my desperation, I was looking for that right hymn that right worship song that's just going to get me there. <clears throat> and I, I couldn't. And God said, mm, don't replace us, me with a song about me. It's good to worship, but it's not me. And he's taught me over the years to just listen to his voice. That's, he'll, he'll talk. He wants to talk. He wants to reveal himself, as we just read. He wants to. But in our human inability to see the heavenly realm, we can get so distracted with the physical realm. Having the ham and the scalped potatoes, it's all good. But God's kind of revealed to me something very unique that I'm, 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 I'm a little intimidated by for about... A couple years now, I get together with a man named Lauren. He's in his 90s, my brother's father-in-law. And when we get together, he says, so what has God taught you this last week? What has God spoke to you this last week? And I realized I grew up in church and never heard that question as asked of me once. I'm not judging, I'm just saying, it's just my reality. 
I learned how to put on the robes and the alcohol. It was good. But it's a little intimidating, this relationship with him, because it's all heavenly, heavenly based. It's easy. I find myself falling into my old habits. How's the weather there? But he doesn't keep me there. In the same way, God will not keep us in the physical. He will reveal to us. Later on, when we get to Pentecost, before it was a certain color, it was a spiritual awakening. And Peter, understanding what was happening in the spirit, was able to say, this is what was promised through the prophets. Your old men will dream dreams, spiritual in nature, and your young men will see visions, and I will pour my spirit out upon all flesh. That's pretty profound. And the purpose for that is so that we are prepared for his return. For it's sooner today than it was yesterday. Thank God. Thank God. My friends in Christ, may the power of his resurrection and the power of the spirit of his resurrection that dwells within us by faith continue to keep our focus, our mindset on heavenly things and not to lose our attention to things that can easily distract us. For the gardener, the Christ, is among us now. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your kindness, for your presence. Your word is true. It is true. May we be living testimonies of your grace. And we pray that you reveal who you are to us more. We confess that we are in bondage to sin, to darkness, to blindness, to ignorance, and cannot free ourselves. But you set us free. May we see the glory, the truth, the eternal truth, the forgiveness and love and beauty, eternal beauty, that is in your name and your kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Our sermon hymn is, If You're Happy and You Know It, 